Good morning, everyone. I'm Michael Brown, and this is the 2019 State of the College Address. We want to welcome everyone who is here with us at the Bioscience Education Center on the Germantown campus. We also want to say good morning to everyone watching online. Now, before I turn things over to Dr. Pollard, I do want to point out that we have set aside time for your questions today. If you're not in a the room, there are three ways to participate. You can send an email at any time to State of the College at MontgomeryCollege.edu. You can post your question on our Facebook Live event, or you can tweet your question to at Montgomery Call using the hashtag AskDrPollard. And now it is my pleasure to introduce the president of Montgomery College, Dr. Darian Pollard. Good morning. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm absolutely delighted to be here, but most importantly, I'm grateful that you've chosen to be here as well. Uh, thank you for taking the time to be here. I know many of you are leaving things in your desk, in the classrooms to be here. And thank you to our viewing audience as well. Uh, this is always a unique opportunity for me to talk about uh, the happenings of the college as we approach the end of the academic year. I just want to take and also a moment, I just noticed that our college council chair is here, Kathy Giovanetti, thank you for choosing to be here today. And certainly uh, many folks within the audience who are here. Um, to everyone watching uh, from home today, I hope that you all will take advantage uh, to uh, send in questions and as we make our time available here that you all will do so as well. I also want to thank uh, Provost Margaret Latimer and our folks here at the Germantown campus for hosting us, our phenomenal MCTV team who always makes things happen, our special events team who does a phenomenal job of making sure that we feel welcomed and they've planned things accordingly. And I would be remiss if I did not also take the opportunity to thank uh, Dr. Megan Gibbons who uh, takes an idea that I say that I want to talk about and turns it into a masterpiece. So I'm always grateful to her uh, for the work that she does in that space. I get to do this every year and I love this event because I get to highlight some of the wonderful accomplishments of the institution and to talk about the future oftentimes. But in this speech this year, I really want to talk a little bit about where do we see us going as a college? What does the workplace of the future look like for us at Montgomery College? How will the county change? And then how will the college prepare students for the work of the future that exists now and work that doesn't even exist that we will have to prepare them for? These are simple questions on the surface, but when you drill down a bit, uh, they require work across all of the visions of the Montgomery College college community. Our MC 2025 team has been working hard on these issues for the last two years, and I'm going to share some of what they found, and I'm going to also talk a little bit about some of the things we should anticipate as we think about this new strategic plan. But before I do that, I want to share some events for their own sake, and I think we have a lot of things we can talk about that we've been doing well at the college. Over the spring break, 10 Montgomery College students traveled to New Mexico to build homes with Habitat for Humanity for folks who are in need. Our Engineers Without Borders student chapter went to Panama, where they were beginning to build a community library that was being designed there. 570 students were enrolled in classes tying open pedagogy to the United Nations Sustainable Development Grants this past year, and 16 of these students presented their work from interdisciplinary assignments. Now, it's pretty clear that our students are already focused on social justice. Uh, they're even using their skills to improve the conditions of people in other nations. And I don't know what that says to you, but that's pretty powerful. They're tackling problems that will require shared solutions at a global level. And these stories say so much about our students and who their hearts are and what their passions are in these day and times. And what their minds are thinking about is they think strategically about their own future. And any strategic planning document that a college will put together has to have these types of thoughts in there. And it has to be responsive to what our faculty and staff are saying is important about the future of the college. You, the employees of the college, have the vision to connect these students with the opportunities to enrich their learning and certainly to prepare them for the decades that lie ahead. And for many of our students, they are already competing and excelling. This year, we have eight semifinalists for the Jack Kent Cook Scholarship, and this is all about academic excellence. 
This award is worth $40,000 in educational expenses to complete a baccalaureate degree. And last year's winner was from Montgomery College, uh, one of the winners, Carolina Zazi, and now she is a student at Cornell University. 50 Montgomery College students were awarded scholarships uh, funds at the Maryland Hispanic Gala this fall. With a dozen institutions from across the state represented, more than half of the awards and scholarships presented that night went to Montgomery College students. Now, I, predict, I actually predict that this is going to continue to grow as we look at the Latino student population that is nearly a quarter of our total student body here at Montgomery College. And I guess it should come as no surprise to you that the Chronicle of Higher Education ranked Montgomery College as the most diverse community college in the continental United States this past year. Now, I think we lost out to uh, some Hawaiian colleges, but... <laughs> You know, the Hawaiian people, they always got something ahead of us. Weather, pineapples, all good things. But all of that being said, all of the diversity that we have at Montgomery College means that we have to pay more attention to equity. Uh, equal access to modern buildings that serve our students' academic and career planning purposes is very important. That's why you see so much construction happening on our campuses right now. Uh, the Rockville Student Center has been coming along with classes starting in January of 2020. Uh, you saw in the Germantown campus as you came here today, wonderful facilities are being built here. And our Tacoma Park Silver Spring campus, the design of the Catherine and Isaiah Leggett Math and Science Building is moving forward steadily. The architect and the construction manager are working collaboratively. And then our Pinckney Innovation Complex for Science and Technology, or PICMC as we finally call it here, is finalizing negotiations with a development partner for a building that will host life sciences and technology companies here on the Germantown campus. The landscape of the college is literally changing right in front of our faces to meet the needs of the future of our students and of our community. Speaking of which, uh, every event that brings K-12 students to our sites is a gateway for future students. The recent Science Olympiad, which brought 500 middle schoolers to the Germantown campus, is a good example of this. It is already feeding partnerships like the college's dual enrollment program, which is surging. Early College has nine new degrees being offered next year, and that's in addition to two degrees that are currently being offered and close to 3,500 parents attended eight meetings on our Montgomery College campuses to understand how high schoolers could earn college credits. I was a little worried about the fire marshal a couple of times, uh, but what's really important about that is that parents and their students are understanding how exciting these opportunities are to connect college as a part of their high school experience. Now, I always don't do this, but I also want to highlight two external collaborations that I'm very proud of this year. Uh, the college has partnered with our new county executive and the new county council with just two months into their tenure around two very important initiatives. Uh, one promotes racial equity and social justice, and the other expands early childhood education opportunities in the county. Uh, my hat off is to our county executive and to our county council president, Nancy Navarro, for their leadership on these fronts, for contributing their energies around really critical issues that are facing our county. And more importantly, I think, recognizing this idea that radical inclusion is something that we all can get behind. The college has been trumpeting this issue for, uh, for many years, and it's wonderful to have partners who are proactively engaged in this conversation. And I know that many of our faculty and staff spent hours uh, collaborating on the details of this work, serving on task force. So I'm very grateful to you for the efforts that you've taken in this regard. In many ways, the future is already here and the college is actively shaping it. We're opening doors for more students in needs with the help of the Montgomery College Foundation. In fact, last Friday's fundraising luncheon was tremendous. And in that event, we raised, just that event alone, $170,000 for additional scholarships. That deserves a hand clap, I think. Here's the other part about that that I think is truly remarkable. The foundation has already raised $23 million toward our $30 million goal uh, for 2020. Our Legacy Fundraiser this year raised $1.7 million for scholarships. 
All of these things are critical because these accomplishments are happening more frequently. As a part of my daring leadership, this idea that I've been trying to think deeply about since returning, I'm expressing more gratitude, uh, more deeply and more thoughtfully, and I'm asking the leadership team at the college to do the same as well. It gives us the fuel to aim higher, and it takes us, I think, a, a more a valuable experience to understand that people are grateful for the work that you do. So let's look at our student uh, success scorecard, for example, to illustrate that. On our major metrics this year, things are holding up pretty good. Um, our retention rates, for example, are about the same as they were last year. Fall to fall is at 65% and fall to spring is at 80%. Uh, there's not too much change in that and both of them are well above the national average. A lot of variables go into retention this year, and our Board of Trustees has spent a whole year looking at this through their constituent conversations. And they're looking at these ideas and these figures and trying to figure out how do we start to really push the needle and improve on these issues. And as you know, if we look at this data disaggregated, we get a better sense of who's struggling within the institution. We also know that graduation and transfer rates dipped a bit to 44% compared to 46% last year when we had a big bump of about five percentage points. But we're still on target in our range and we're certainly above the national average for our college size according to our IPEDS data. One area in which we're seeing gains across the board though is in developmental education. Uh, completion rates for students taking developmental math and English in their first years are going up. As you may know, there have been some recent curricular changes in these programs as well, so we're looking forward to seeing how that will impact, again, more effectiveness, more efficiency, and helping students to accelerate their completion through our developmental course sequence. So there's a lot to celebrate on our scorecard, and you're going to see more about that as it gets finalized by our research area and we send that out. But let's keep in mind that there's always fluctuations, uh, there's always opportunities for improvement, and a part of our work as a college is to actively engage in that, to understand and know our numbers, to be competent in our conversations about those numbers, and more importantly, design systems that can start to improve those numbers over time. Such is the fact that we know that our ACES students, we have about 2,500 ACES students who are enjoying the support that they receive here at the college. 146 of them are on track to graduate from the college this year, and another 25 are on track to graduate from the universities at Shady Grove are achieving the promise students. There are 430 of them who are receiving coaching one-on-one -on -one, and they're singing the praises. In fact, last night they filled up the council hall as we were talking about the needs of our employees and of our college as it relates to the budget. And I'm really proud of the college's commitments around these metrics and understanding what the impact of those things are. We're holding ourselves accountable for our student success and we're trying to understand how we start to change the reality for so many students. It took a lot of planning and coordination to agree on what to measure and how to measure it, but we've seen several years of data to compare, and we're talking about trends rather than snapshots in time. And we're going to continue our advancement around uh, demographics and data analytics, and we're poised to look at a new uh, shape of the future for the college in this space. We've already begun an updated version of meeting the changing demography that's happening around us in Montgomery County. Our mission is the same. We still empower students, we still uh, serve the community, and we still hold ourselves accountable. But we'll do so in the context of an advancing uh, technology, demographic changes, and new fiscal constraints as well. You can see on this slide that diversity in the county will continue to grow, according to projections, as will the demand for skilled workers. Our traditional measures of student success will stand, but they will be tethered to a set of new realities for the workforce and also for the county. And over the past year, our MC 2025 team has been studying these projections extremely carefully. They've been talking to stakeholders about the next chapter of the college, and they've been asking questions such as, what additional skills and knowledge will students need by 2025? What shifts are coming in the labor market? How can the college create more opportunity in the county? Now, as a humanist, I tend to think that education has value for its own sake. It has a purpose that's intrinsic and personal to you. 
But I also have had to temper that in the last few years to make sure that we're serving students in ways that empower them to be in the marketplace and to be effective in providing for them and their families. And I'm thinking more intentionally about how we can partner with the county to have the impact that is deeper, well beyond the college in this space. And one thing that I know that I think is very important throughout all of this is that our work will be grounded in excellence, rigor, and equity. The college has grown considerably in making degrees work for our students. I've seen this leadership all across the institution. I've seen it in our academic program advising, which is ensuring the students understand the requirements of their unique guided academic paths. We've seen it in our counseling faculty who are being intentional about helping people and our students to plan well beyond their degrees and helping to guide them through their academic programs here. I've seen this with our transfer ambassadors who are putting our students on the road to baccalaureate degrees from the day they begin their associate's program. And I also see it in our workforce development team who are working on the front lines of preparing students who need credentials and need to go to work within six months, not a year, not two. And as a result of that, we have some great examples of phenomenal work that's occurring. We have a new 90-hour course that is now being offered at the Identity Center in Gaithersburg. These are two classes offered in child growth and development that can prepare a student for the credentials to work in a child care center within three months. The Montgomery College Foundation is providing scholarships to 22 students while Identity gives the students a stipend for their living expenses. That to me is equity in action. We're also currently partnering with the county on an initiative to increase early childcare options for residents in this community. The county has committed to providing 600 additional spaces in the next four years, and the college has accepted the role of training the teachers who will fill these new classrooms. This is a great example of a collective impact model that our county is using more and more. When separate organizations from different sectors with different competencies coordinate in their efforts to solve a shared problem, to work on critical needs that are exact happening in our community, such as affordable early childcare education, we brought together local government, private and public entities, child care providers, regulators, developers, and so many more people were a part of that conversation. We brought everyone to the table who has a vested interest in the solution, and we've decided how to move forward together. And very grateful to the work of Movie Montgomery Ford for its leadership in helping us do that. I think we're going to see a lot more of this happening for us in the next five years, and certainly even more than that, as budget constraints continue to make us realize that operating independently is not an option. In fact, Margaret and I, when we were at the hearing last night, one of the comments that we made while we were advocating about the needs of Montgomery College, it is very clear that there are many needs that are taking place within this county right now. And any time you have the opportunity to go to one of these hearings, I certainly want you there to support support the needs of Montgomery College. But I think it's important for us to understand that we operate in an ecosystem that is far bigger than us. And to understand how that impacts where things are going, I think it's an important thing to, for us to understand. We are going to have to think about how we empower students in new ways. And just seeing how much feedback that has come from our MC 2025 Strategic Planning Committee and how they've attracted this feedback, I think speaks to the potency of what Montgomery College is. Our academic master plan and student affairs plans are excellent pieces. But one of the things that we're learning is that we should rigorously integrate uh, these into a single plan so they're working from the same page and empowering all students to change their lives. Now I talked about this at the Staff Enrichment Day because I heard, hear from empowered students all the time. Uh, I actually think you would be surprised if you knew the numbers of emails and calls and letters that I get from students each and every day. Uh, the vast majority of them want to tell me about a fantastic faculty member uh, and a professor in a class who's done tremendous work for them. Or they want to talk about a special program that's changing their life and giving them access to a reality that they didn't even know that existed. 
I literally have stacks of letters and I keep them. When I'm having a bad day, I read them over and over and over again. And we use them for mission moments when we want to talk about the potency of Montgomery College. I wish I could read every last one of them to you. We'd have to have a reading marathon for us to take care of that. But this is the work of our faculty and staff. This is the work that you do. Uh, I get to receive the letters so people can tell me that, but it's the work that you do each and every day, working with our students, working with our community to make this real. And I'm endlessly impressed with our faculty and staff and how they're rising to meet the needs of our students. Um, as we finalize the goals for the next chapter of the college, our MC 2025 planning team has talked to many students about their experiences here at Montgomery College. One thing that comes up over and over again is how many of our students rely heavily on the support systems of the college. These must continue to be rigorous so that every student has a chance to achieve. Empower students to soar, uh, to start smart, succeed, and soar. In, meet, in meeting the needs of our students, the planning team has focused on a few elements of the student experience that we know is fundamental. These are seamless beginnings from registration to financial aid to class scheduling. We asked them about their experiences of getting on board. Uh, we talked to the students, we asked them to move on to talk about teaching and learning. And we asked them, are their experiences in the classroom and learning centers transformational for them? Are students getting the support that moves them purposefully toward their goals? We got some good feedback and we learned some critical information. So I'd like to share some of that with you right now. Welcome Center the first time, they helped me a lot. I, I had to do even more things before I could enroll classes, so, but they guide, guided me and even the international coordinator, he helped me a lot too. My first time at MC was actually during Summer Bridge at CSU 100 and that class was basically my, um, my push off in a sense because I felt a bit more prepared and ready as the fall semester started, knowing that I knew where my classes were, knowing that I can find the Science Learning Center or um, the Math um, Learning Center. So I think my ACES coach, my CEO coach, and SDSU 100 was like the big three things, the biggest things that really helped me. I ended up meeting a person from the financial aid office. His name is Rene Argueta. Perfect. Like he spoke Spanish. He told my parents, like, you know, I wasn't, my parents wanted to know what was going on. Um, I was able to talk to him. I was like, okay, what are my options? How do I? go about doing these things. Um, he's able to relate to you in a way where you don't have to say much. Like he just gets you and he's like, okay, here, let me help you out. Let me explain the process to you. Uh, paperwork in Spanish or English, regardless. And he just helped. It is extremely important to have that person to be one-on-one -on -one with that advisor, the counselor, uh, because sometimes you just, you kind of forget that you do matter. You know, you, especially if you come from a family who m may not be as knowledgeable about the process of, you know, college and whatnot. I had not been in school for a while, so it was kind of, wow, okay, I've really forgotten a lot. So I had one friend and told me about ATP. It's a great program, I mean, if I could shout it out from the rooftops, I would. And I really like it because it's... It depends on your schedule. You don't just have to have a one-on-one -on -one coach. You can have embedded coaching. And the good thing about having a coach is that they are always in communication with your teachers. So whenever we're having grades and everything, my TPA coach reaches out, okay, this is my student. How is she doing? And then my teacher responds back, she's doing well. You know, I think the student-teacher relationship is important. Like one of my professors, Ms. McLaughlin, she's a psych teacher. She had a very big uh, influence on what I wanted to study because I really like psychology. And I ended up choosing social work because I was like, okay, you know, I looked at my job opportunities and just thinking long term as to um, what I want to do later on. Um, she exposed me to uh, options that I could do. And I had the best professor ever. She has actually become my advisor. She encourages her students all the time. She tells them, hey, this honors program is accepting applications, submit it, submit it. She pushes her students to do that and she helps them with whatever they need, which is one of the most effective ways, I think, of getting information across to students. So advice for faculty and staff would be to just 
really care about your students and know the importance of these little interactions that you might not give a second thought to, but every single interaction that you have with a student can shape them. So my main goal was to get into the Macklin Business Institute, an honors program here, and she told me the only thing I can tell you for getting into the program is to get really active on campus. And so I did so. Um, so diving in head first, I decided to get in, involved in a lot of activities. Campus life is amazing. Uh, I am involved in so much and I'm aware of the resources that Montgomery College provides, but that was not me when I first got here. So I was completely oblivious. I just went to class and went back home. Get involved in, in as many activities as you can when you start because by doing that you actually get the time to sort out which activities you find that will be beneficial for your time while you're here at Montgomery College. I really like how we have like the mobile markets of specific days that help students and it shows students that you know what, we're not just a school that cares about if you are going to classes or not. We also care about the physical needs. We understand that you coming to school is not just one part. We're also trying to make sure that you have all the resources that you need, especially physically. So you have something to eat and you're not coming to class hungry and everything. So those programs that are already in place, I really would like for them to continue because it shows that you care about me as a student. You don't just care about me as a number, but it's like you're seeing me individually and you're catering things that would matter for me. Montgomery College has such a diverse community and every day it's like what can I learn, what can I get from this interaction with this person. I was accepted as a person of the LGBT community. I was accepted as a Latino. I was accepted as an immigrant. All those factors you don't you don't necessarily get that elsewhere, um, especially at bigger institutions where their focus is on you know other students. So I really love the fact that Montgomery College have really covers those three cr criterias for myself. And that's how, why I feel so much at home, because I can walk down these hallways and feel very accepted. One thing my dad always made me realize is that school is not just part of the academics. And it tells me that if you pass through a school and the school does not pass through you, then you've really done nothing. You've just wasted four years or how many years of your life. In a sense, it's like, well, it's a college and it's preparing you for um, the outside world. So it's not a matter of changing anything. I just um, want the college to maintain that status of preparing you for the outside world. Isn't that a great line that you, if the college doesn't pass through you? I, 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 uh, I spent a lot of time thinking about it the first time I heard it, and it's a very powerful concept of a presence and being. And these are the types of things that we have to think about uh, as we start looking at MC 2025, proactively envisioning what our students need us to be as an organization. And all of our strategies must be grounded in excellence, rigor, and equity. And while they are busy figuring out the section of biology that can fit into their schedule, we need to be talking to employers like AstraZeneca and Kaiser Permanente and the NIH to see what jobs will be needed in the next five years. Uh, we need to be increasingly nimble and responsive, and not just on paper, not just a tagline to say we do this, but we have to figure out how we respond and what the industry is also telling us needs to be doing. As we heard from our students, the college is already creating many experiences for them that are truly powerful and transformational. We'll continue to build on what's been working well and zero in on where we can amplify ideas to improve. You probably notice how often the students mentioned a teacher or a faculty member or a particular class that inspired them or gave them direction. Creating more of these transformational learning experiences and practices and learning environments is exactly what is a priority within MC 2025. We hear most often that these are working, so we're going to do more of them. Uh, the Scholarship of Excellence in Teaching is a great example of this. We have 48 faculty members who have participated in this experience. The Smithsonian Faculty Fellowships is another experience that helps faculty to guide students, to support them, and connect them to the world outside of the classroom. 
supportive environments that enhance teaching and promote student success, these will continue to be a priority in the college's next phase of MC 2025. In fact, the scholarship on teaching and learning and student retention echoes this for all kinds of student programs. Uh, students who work on their Raptor Tank uh, pitch uh, programs together, they stay engaged. Uh, students who practice for the Beacon Honors Conference or for the Swarmathon, a robotics competition, they stay engaged. Anything that we can do to keep students in interested in learning pays significant benefits for them. Generally, it makes them better job candidates as well. Empowering students uh, continues to be the center of our work here at Montgomery College. We talk to them about the experiences that motivated them, internships, competitions, or learning communities. Those all rank very high when the students share with us what, those, uh, what meant more to them. And we're going to be doing more of that in the coming years. We'll strive for more equity as well in such experiences in the next phase. Uh, they're clearly a part of the formula for success for our students, so let's make sure that all students have the opportunity to be engaged and involved in these experiences. As technology continues to change at its rapid rate, the college will need to be attuned to how this impacts the skill sets that our students are needed. Uh, for many years, we've talked about the knowledge economy, uh, this idea of how students are, were valued for the knowledge that they bring into the classroom, or more importantly, into the workforce. And that's still going to be true. But we've already entered another phase of our uh, culture, which is knowledge is much more accessible 24-7 online than any of us who are over the age of 35 even thought would be possible. Uh, our son constantly says, Mama, search it up. Just search it up when he has a question. And I'm always amazed because he's lived in a world where this has always been the case, right? Anything he needs to know, we search it up and we can find it out for him. How to find, though, the right knowledge and apply it successfully to real world problems is going to be the new work skill that's going to be needed for our students. Being educated in certain fields will get you in the door, but using that knowledge in creative ways is what's going to keep you employed and keep you there. This is essential in what we call the post-knowledge economy. We're not leaving knowledge behind, we're curating it. We're giving it meaning. You can go online and there's lots of knowledge out there. You can Google anything and you'll get thousands and thousands of pages of information. Our value as educators is in our ability to connect silos of knowledge, uh, to convey its depth, and to provide context. This level of discernment is even more important in this era because workers are being asked to do more with knowledge. Skilled workers in the post-knowledge economy, post economy have to know how to find information, interpret it, and then apply it to complex problems. I think this is a more sophisticated paradigm of thinking about what our students will need to be able to do. I also will say it's what we will need to be able to do as employees of an educational institution. Now, I actually find this dynamic very comforting as a humanist. We've been hearing for over a decade that artificial intelligence is going to displace so many of us. But now that it's here, businesses are finding that humans are still valuable. <laughs> um, it's how humans manipulate this intelligence is what makes companies successful. Even the founder of Tesla found this out. Uh, my favorite part of this statement is that he says, humans are underrated. <laughs> I'm thinking about having that as a sign on my door, right? Um, this leads me to another important part of our MC 2025 planning process. There have been a lot of humans involved in this process. In fact, over 400 of them have been engaged in this. Now, you may have asked, do we need this many people? Uh, do we have to have this many meetings? Some people say, couldn't you just go in a room and write a plan and come out? Uh, no, we could not have do, do that, and yes, we needed all of these voices to be actively engaged in the process. Because another feature of the post-knowledge economy is a dramatic increase in the synergy among education, business, and the community. Even more collective impact work is being done. Closing the opportunity gap is a feat that none of us can do alone. In fact, if we think we can do it long, we're alone, we're in the wrong business. 
Um, closing this opportunity gap means that we're going to have to partner more deeply and more intentionally, such as our partners with MCPS and USG, to create academic pathways. Um, and these pathways we know are working. For example, we know that 146 ACES students will be graduating this year. 99% of them are moving on for further education into a pathway that they understood from the moment they left high school through their experience here at Montgomery College and now to their four-year institution. In our next chapter, the college will continue our educational partnerships with vigor. To do this, we'll need to engage with the community in many levels, with more richness and more depth. Meeting our students where they are will continue to be a strategy. Uh, that may be in our refugee training center, or a free class in our community engagement center, or in a non-credit a non class. We would need to be more intentional about pushing our boundaries, reaching out to dislocated youth and adjudicated youth. Our partners tell us that despite all of our efforts, there are still students who don't know the college, don't know how to access the college, don't know that this is a place for them, that was designed for them, and they don't believe they can afford to come to Montgomery College. We need to do a better job in filling in these information gaps to help these youth and adults understand that Montgomery College is their college. Our community engagement centers are natural starting points for this work, as we've seen. Among our many foreign-born students, Ethiopian students lead the way among graduates last year. I'm sure these results are connected to our new pop-up community engagement centers that are working in the Ethiopian Community Center. The college now offers computer literacy classes taught by bilingual staff members at that center. This draws students in and may ultimately lead them, dare I say, put them on a pathway to credit work within the institution. The Careers in Healthcare for Community Engagement program offers scholarships that put uh, people to work as phlebotomists, certified nursing assistants, medical assistants, and more after a period of training. The pop-up model that we have been pilot piloting brings MC services to locations where people already go and gather in their community. We partner with organizations that provide the space and some outreach dare I say, are trusted partners with communities, and we provide the instruction and scholarships. This is a model that is growing in popularity as space and fiscal constraints limit how many new community engagement centers that the college can propose and sustain. The connections that these nonprofits provide to local students is invaluable. The college is meeting students literally right where they are. And we're finding that our community allies are responding by collaborating with us more fully to create comfort zones where education can take place. Uh, by the way, our Hispanic student population has grown from 19% in 2012 to more than 25% in 2019. Because this group is often filled with first generation students, our partnerships with trusted nonprofit community based entities are going to be essential because Montgomery College will need to continue planting seeds of college consciousness in this population of students because we want them to see Montgomery College as a first choice of education for the futures that they want to have. Now, we're clearly enriching the life of the community at the level of education, but actually closing the opportunity gap also means meeting businesses where they are. About 65% of children entering elementary school today will ultimately work at jobs that do not currently exist. Now think about that. 65% will work at jobs that don't currently exist today. So preparing those children for jobs that they will have in 15 years takes some special communication with businesses. The college is already fueling the economy with ready workers, but the future will need to be more attuned to matching our curricular pathways to labor market needs. The college already does this exceptionally well. For example, by 2040, one in five residents in Montgomery County will be 65 years or older. The college's partnership with Ingleside at King Farm is preparing us to help fulfill the growing need for elder care in our community. 
Already 80 students have graduated from the Certified Nursing Assistance Program in the past five years. A related example is a year-long partnership between the college and the Montgomery County Department of Housing and Community Affairs to offer a class that says entitled Understanding Aging, a Leadership Training Certificate for Senior Housing Staff. 30 students are being specially trained in leadership skills tailored to county-funded assistant living facilities. And just this last year, we learned that hospitals like Holy Cross Germantown, right down the road, uh, need nurses that can hit the ground with less orientation uh, training. So we created a new independent study for nursing students, which provides additional internship and clinical experience beyond that which they receive in school. In fact, these students have an additional 180 hours above the minimum graduation requirements where they're paired with nursing staff and allowed to follow them in their schedules within the hospital. Holy Cross Health pay, helped pay for this. Our students got credit for this and the college created more seamless pathways for graduation to employment for our students. And even if these students don't go to work for Holy Cross Health, they have a stronger competitive edge with the independent study at any hospital across the region or nation. The biotech corridor is a reality that impacts our curriculum regularly. A pilot program for pre-health students this year pairs two classes that were previously sequential, foundational math and introduction to biology. Rather than making students wait to finish math until they can sign up and then sign up for biology, we're putting those two classes together. The idea is that one may reinforce the learning of the other, and students may be, in more significant ways, able to complete and complete on time, which is a very important factor. While their official results aren't in, the semester's not over yet, we're still working, uh, they look very strong, so I've been told. Another area of emerging careers is in bioinformatics. There is a growing number of jobs for technicians who assist scientists in pharmaceuticals, biotechnology, and computer information science, among other areas. Since we see a growth in this field, the bioinformatics program was developed to fill a hole that we had within our curriculum. Now we have an associate's degree in bioinformatics, which was previously offered only at the master's level. Finally, with the growing number of non-native English speakers of English, um, English language for academic purposes has created modules that allow for our ELAP students to study English while taking credit courses such as psychology, engineering, and chemistry. By focusing on the language they need to master the discipline, they're moving more quickly towards their goal. They're learning language in context, which all of us who have some background in linguistics knows that this is very important. The more the college can be a real-time player in workforce skills, the bigger impact we will have in 2025. Now putting my humanist hack back on for a minute, some of the excitement about how different the work will be can somewhat be exaggerated. We're bombarded with messages about the revolution that's taking place in the workplace. Uh, certainly the jobs, the future, and the workplace will look different. Um, when I looked for my first job, I did not use LinkedIn or CareerBuilder. Uh, I didn't use Monster, and I don't even know if that still exists anymore. But those are not a part of the experiences that I had when I looked for my first job or even my most recent job being here. But in the end, as Elon Musk discovered belatedly, we are still employing humans. And when we talk to employees about what skills they think their future and current employees need and where they see graduates lacking, they often cite what some of us call soft skills. Now, I'm not a fan of that term. A few of you have heard me talk about this extensively because I think it minimizes what those skills are. And what we're talking about is clear communication, strong writing skills, the ability to work in a team, to be adaptable, all the things that you learn in courses such as your general education courses. And I don't think that there are any skills that are probably more important in today's worker right now. So I'm gonna call them power skills. I'm on a movement nationally to drop the word soft skills and to call them power skills. No amount of technological know-how is going to fix a team that is not communicating optimally or solving problems successfully. 
And as the diversity of our workforce grows, these challenges do not go away. And as educators, we can't lose sight of that in our curriculum. When the MC 2025 planning team met with business leaders, even those in high tech fields, the issue came up again and again and again and again. Students must be able to write fluently, to communicate complex ideas, to take initiative, and to manage their time. Now, we teach this every day in hundreds of courses that we teach here at Montgomery College. Every single one of you is teaching students for the job market. How many of you work in the sciences? How many of you teach in general education? Do any of your students, are they able to be successful if they're not able to communicate in those classes? That to me, I think is critically important. So I think that we have our answer, that power skills are just as valuable in the post-knowledge economy as they've ever been. Our role in fueling the economy for the employers and driving economic mobility for our students is as robust as ever. If you're teaching history or English or writing or sociology, these are job skills that are as important as Java programming. Employers tell us that technology skills may get the students in the door, but the power skills will keep them employed. Fueling the economy means providing workers who are holistically prepared for the workforce. And that is what MC 2025 is going to be about. Community engagement is another critical piece that has come to light in our strategic planning efforts. The college has been involved in this for decades, but each era requires a few new features. Our latest efforts have been the creation of centers, which have attracted visitors with classes in computer literacy, child growth and development, serve safe for food preparation workers. Enriching the life of our community is not only a part of our original mission, it is what helps us to make good business sense and make a good business case as well. One of the hidden gems of Montgomery County is the number of nonprofits who work tirelessly to focus on issues that are not just limited to education. I'm thinking about nutrition, legal services, immigration, health care, tutoring, uh, career guidance. In fact, any issue that exists, there is at least two nonprofits in Montgomery County that are working on that. These nonprofits are the college's natural allies as we think about providing those essential support services for our students to help them be successful. Our partnerships are already a part of a larger ecosystem of support that our students need most. And I predict that these will become bigger in the future as local government resources become more constrained. Now, I've long said that making community colleges hubs for accessing services like this is a natural evolution of who we are and our mission. The mobile markets that were cited in the video that we do right now are regular events on our campuses that are drawing our students in. But here's the other thing, they're drawing in community members as well. In fact, we know that in this past year, we've had over 700 community members come to our mobile markets on campus. The student health and wellness initiatives are now connecting our students with the county resources that provide them help with housing assistance, medical and dental care, as well as mental health assessment. These natural parts of the work are an evolution of what we do. No, we are not a social service agency, but we know quite a few who do the work and to connect our students to those things are part of what we do. From a planning perspective, as we think about MC 2025, we have to think about this and think more about how we can connect our students. Let's learn with what some of our partners say about this. Montgomery College is one of those uh, you know, best kept secrets for most of our parents in the county. And the local talent Montgomery College is really our hub of excellence here from a training perspective and also just given their physical presence in the county. So they really should t be the leader in trying to uh, promote innovation from and work with nonprofits, work with businesses, and work with the community in general so that we can kind of be the, at the forefront of giving um, learners at all levels opportunities. I think a lot of it is just showing up in the community over and over and over again. There are so many organizations like ours in the, in the county that 
have strong ties in very specific communities where not everyone knows all of the offerings that Montgomery College has or they don't know the strength of Montgomery College. The, the, result. Uh, the creation of the community engagement uh, department, it is one, one of uh, uh, the huge advantage for the college. Engage MCPS to encourage more students either to have other dual enrollment programs or to better explain the options. I'm a parent of four students. Um, all of my students, I think, see themselves as college bound, but I've never heard any of my students actually um, express where Montgomery College would fit into their plan, and I think I represent the middle of the county, um, and that is a huge demographic. I think that we need a program like ACES for just the regular students, because there's so many, there's so many people who are coming into college who have no idea. We often assume that second and even third generation families understand the college system. Well, the college that their parents and grandparents went to is very different than college today. If you get to their parents, especially with young immigrant youth, like they're, that's who's pushing them to go to college to, to change their family's trajectory. And we need to make sure that they know about all the options that are available to them or that are affordable to them that can make it a reality instead of just a fantasy that they see on TV. Rather than saying they have challenges, how do we help the students overcome those challenges to be successful? I think we really need to talk more about that especially for um, black male youth. We, we really need to help them not only understand the process, but what's available to them, and that yes, they can be successful. Right, financially doesn't count. For non-credit, so really. Oh, for non-credit. Right, yeah. non credit yes, yes, yes. And oftentimes. Basically, we're looking to close the opportunity divide and level the playing field, address income inequality. But financially, they have a problem with paying for courses, so they are reluctant to attend. Tell the student, we can help pay for your college education. When the student had no idea what financial aid was, they had no idea what they were, uh, uh, um, what they were eligible for, and it was like a, a blinders being lifted. It is becoming um, a vital role for the college uh, to go to the community and expand uh, that relationship with the community so that people will come to the college. Part of what's attracting them into our own job training programs is that they're going to go get a job yes. right now. They're going to go do something right now, but they need to be tied into going back to school as much as they are into getting a job. What do you say to uh, someone who needs to get a GED? There are plenty of programs they can go to, but if we send them here, we get them on a college campus, we get them knowing not just the experience of getting their GED and sitting in a, in, a, in a cubicle in a classroom like they left a few years ago, but there's an opportunity to see other, like see what college life is like, see other parts of the county they may not know as well, so it's a win-win for us. Uh, shift that mindset among our parents and students of, of really what Montgomery College is and, and the role that it plays. The students who are graduating from, uh, from Montgomery College they are uh, the economic uh, backbone for the, for the local economy. Our goal is economic self-sufficiency so that they can remain in this county as productive citizens. We need much more targeted pathways uh, so that students get the knowledge and technological skills that they need to uh, survive in today's workforce. Montgomery County Public Schools, Montgomery College, for your institutions mm -hmm. are knocking often, knocking on the same, same industry doors, doors yes. for internship, yes. inter internship. Mm -hmm. So maybe that collaboration yeah. can help us all be more strategic in how we approach our industry partners and have these experiences for our students. Montgomery College is here to help you be successful in whatever your goal is, whether it's to continue on to a four-year school, whether it is to get credentialed, or whether it is to attend college without knowing specifically what I'd like to do, but I know I need college and I know this is a first step for me on to the career or the position or job that I'm eventually going to get.
So asking our partners uh, to help us understand what underserved students need tells us that we're in the right direction. Uh, we, they are in the front line oftentimes working with students and communities that we may not be in front of. So it's a very powerful moment for us. Adjudicated youth, they face particularly strong barriers to education. So, so do pregnant teens and dual enrollment students who are not old enough yet to drive. As we heard, African-American men, special needs and focuses need to be placed there as well. So we're going to have very targeted strategies in MC 2025 to look at these populations. And we hear about this anecdotally, but we also see it in our scorecard data, which you'll be seeing later, uh, because we disaggregate that data. And it's important for us to understand and own what that data is telling us about the student success experience here at Montgomery College. Our partners who specialize with these groups tell us and give us important insights, and they suggest approaches to how we can be more effective in working with any number of different populations. So the college will partner more tightly, more deeply, more richly uh, with these community partners so that these students can have the outcomes that they deserve at Montgomery College. And I think you can hear in the folks in the video, uh, they're very passionate about their work. Uh, their counselors, their advocates, their mentors, uh, their career advisors. In fact, most of them already serve students in many capacities. They're terrific resources for us. But we have to ask some important questions with that. Are we connecting with all of the communities that we need to be connecting with? Are we putting up any barriers to enrollment of which we're not aware? <laughs> Even more importantly, are there barriers of which we are aware that we haven't had the courage to deal with? Mm -hmm. Those are important questions as well. This is where my, one of my lessons from Brene Brown comes in. There is something valuable in making ourselves vulnerable as an institution. When we ask the people that we serve, students and nonprofits and our employers, for feedback, we have to be ready to hear it and we have to be ready to act upon it. That's where growth occurs. And we've been painstaking about this in the 400 people who've been a part of the strategic planning process. And we'll continue that into the next stage of the drafting. In fact, I understand there are six more meetings planned. Uh, the Board of Trustees is offering their feedback as well. So I'm hopeful that each of you will take the opportunity, those who are here, those who are watching uh, remotely, to contribute your thoughts and feedback to the goals and the types of things that we need to be considering that are measurable, attainable, with equity excellence, eg uh, rigor, and equity as we move forward into our next strategic plan. Another element of the plan is one you already are familiar with, accountability. Now we hear this all the time, we are accountable for our results. And as an institution, we've grown significantly better and more sophisticated in this space um, through our middle states evaluation, uh, through our reorganizations we've done in academic affairs and student affairs, through our Achieving the Dream coaching, through our implementation of the Career and College Readiness Act. All of these things have given us opportunities to think more deeply about how we respond to metrics, some that we develop our own, some that are placed upon us by others as well. And if you work in institutional research and planning, you may remember the first time that we did the student success scorecard. Uh, it was a big deal. Uh, not just the way it looked, but gathering the data, learning how we were making certain definitions. Now I think we've developed a very disciplined approach to it. Uh, we're working diligently so that as an institution, now we're looking at trends. We're not in patterns. We're not looking episodically at pieces of data. So it should come to us as no surprise that accountability is going to be on the rise. In fact, the director of the Georgetown University Center for Education and Workforce has some insights on this, which you'll see in a moment. But before that, I have to say that as higher education becomes more valued in the workplace, student success in the classroom is becoming tied to another metric, that is employment. Uh, the college is much better equipped to manage this than many other schools than we know. Our strengths in workforce development and career counseling and partnerships with industry are a safeguard against these new demands. In fact, when I first heard uh, Dr. Anthony Carnavelli speak on this topic, I thought, mm, the college is in pretty good shape. Uh, we, have our, we have to up our game in a couple of areas. We have to keep college affordable. We have to communi uh, communicate with many groups. We have to do all of these things that the post-knowledge economy requires. But there's no single element of his assessment that catches us 
um, by surprise. With the right planning, in which we're already gay, engaged, the college will expand and serve with deeper impact some successful outcomes through 2025. What future trends do you foresee for higher education and the labor market? I think in the end where we're going is that we're going to be living in a world where institutions matter less, that is the college you go to matters less, um, the degree level matters less and the subject matter is more important, which means that accountability in higher education, and you see this in adult education, your own field, the accountability in higher education will be by program. And we've built information systems. The Obama administration said, spent $760 million building out information that, systems that allow us to look at individual programs, biology and engineering and heating, ventilation and air, air conditioning or whatever to find out whether they are justified in terms of the benefit they deliver relative to their cost. And that's where we're going. It's a, we're headed for a world in which uh, higher education is going to start selling its programs. And it'll be less about the sale of the institution, uh, less about going to Georgetown versus UVA, more about whether the, institu the institutional program you choose. Mm. So accountability is not going anywhere as it relates to how we think about work. It also is important for us as we think about our employees of the institution. Uh, many of you know that we have engaged in a series of self-assessments over the last couple of years, being thoughtful around civility, ethics, uh, thinking about how we experience our organization in terms of equity. And in MC 2025, we're going to make that a priority. Uh, they are fundamental ethics, uh, equity, civility, and how we think about a workplace. Uh, we're also going to be talking intentionally about career pathways for our employees. These two issues are deeply related. A culture of civility and robust career pathways are important to employees within the organization. We can't just talk about it for students. We have to talk about it for our employees as well. Uh, the post-knowledge economy means changes for everyone. Uh, the way that we do our work, where we work, and how we measure the impact of our work. So throughout all of this change, the college will invest more in our employees. As the draft plan looks at it right now, this means better onboarding, improved performance evaluations, and more transparent dialogue about compensation. Improved communication about equity and inclusion will be a part of our plan, and clearly articulated career pathways are essential as well. If you're deeply committed to the college's mission and are talented and ambitious, we want you to stay here. We want you to feel engaged and we want you to be a part of the present and the future of the college. We want you to thrive here. So paths to upskilling and expanding responsibilities should be readily available to you. And that is something we're focusing on in MC 2025. A recent article in Forbes magazine mentioned that employees who see evidence of proactive communication and workplace trust are 15 times more likely to think that their company measures and rewards ethical conduct. Building a culture that supports employee engagement, growth, and career development is necessary as we start to compete for 2025, so will be a strategic focus of the college in our next strategic plan. And one final thread that is connected through all of this is keeping the college affordable. Now you may be aware that the Board of Trustees approved tuition increases Monday night after a rigorous and lengthy conversation. And we know that this is not something that they wanted to do because they see this as yet another barrier to students potentially completing a college. The board recognized, though, that a lot of the decisions, unfortunately, are out of our control about how can we respond to this. The reality is that all parts of the college are connected fiscally. 
Our spending on operations and programs has to be disciplined and it has to be rigorously tied to our institutional priorities. We have many tools to help us figure this out, more than what we had when we did MC 2020. We have detailed integrated master plans in academic affairs and student affairs. We have tighter collaboration between those units. We're using more metrics to measure success over time, and we're getting more feedback from people about how things are working or not working as an institution. So I'm asking everyone to look at the big picture as they start making decisions about spending, whether that be little spending or big spending as an institution. I'm asking for greater transparency as we think about that. Our fiscal responsibility impacts our students, it impacts our community, so it's important that all of us take responsibility for that collectively. And since I've mentioned accountability so many times uh, today and I've presented a plan that is complex, I want to give you an idea about how we're going to be tracking those goals. This is still a work in progress. Uh, Dr. Long and Dr. Scott said, you sure you want to show this? I said, yeah, because we're still working on it. But the MC 2025 team has developed a heat map, uh, which includes all of the goals in their current iteration and some indicators for success. Each of the outcomes will be grounded in excellence, rigor, and equity. And you can see this color scheme that we're using. Green is great in progress, yellow is some progress, and red means we got some work to do. Um, the mapping allows us to look at the full plan and quickly get a sense of what needs attention. Now, I hope that you get a sense of the scope of what MC 2025 is about and how much input has already been incorporated into the development of it. And we're still gathering more information. As I said, there's six more sessions planned. Please be a part of that, actively engaged in this. You can also go to the website. Uh, on, on the top of the goals, we're developing objectives and indicators, so feedback is needed and it is welcome. It's a process, people, and it takes a village to get it done. Finally, I can point to dozens of ways in which we have grown as an organization and positioned ourselves well uh, for, to maximize the next chapter of the future of Montgomery College. When I compare this to the work that we did for MC 2020, which was very valuable, this stage adds another level and probably added responsibility and added dimension to the work. When you plan successfully in one phase for an organization, the succeeding planning that happens after that is going to have greater impact. That's because you have laid the groundwork for what the organization is going to do. Now we're on the next level. Uh, dare I say we're progressing, we're becoming more sophisticated and mature about the work that we're doing. We know how solid our master planning has been, and we can appreciate how accountability works and how we have to have data to draw conclusions about the things that we do and how we need to do them. We have a depth in our partnerships, and we're redefining the way we think about partnerships in the county. I'll also tell you we're leading the county in some serious conversations about this. We've done some very substantial work around fiscal stewardship, and we're leaning in and strengthening our workplace so that people want to bring more of themselves to the work that we do for our students and community. And in the past five years, I've seen us, uh, our shared investment in our students take on new creativity and new excellence. We're working with fewer resources in some areas, and somehow we're providing more for our students. That's the kind of magic that you hope to see and you pray for, but that you often don't get to see. I have a lot of hope for who we are and where we are as an organization. Not because of anything that you can see on a heat map, as pretty as it is, or on a scorecard, or even in a strategic plan uh, that we're going to have. Because I know something, though, about the hearts of the people that work at Montgomery College. I see it each and every day and how you do the work. I see it with how you do it sometimes in spite of confusion, how you're trying to figure things out, whether that be external forces or internal forces. I know about your commitment. I see it and I feel it. So we're ready for this. We're ready for the next level. We're gonna get this work done. Here's the part about how I know we're gonna do it, because we owe it to our students, we owe it to our communities, and we certainly owe it to the future of this particular county of which we are part. Thank you all for being here, and I'm done.
Well, thank you, Dr. Pollard. And as promised, we have set aside time for your questions once again. If you're watching online, there are three, wa three ways to participate. You can email your question to State of the College at MontgomeryCollege.edu. You can post your question on our Facebook Live event, or you can tweet your question to at Montgomery Call using the hashtag AskDrPollard. So, we'd like to begin with questions. Anyone here in the room? Hmm. Ah. Hi, um, my name is Cesar Naren, I'm in finance. Uh, I have a specific question about returning soldiers. Um, I just want to hear a little bit more about the college plan of reintegrating them into the excellent education that we offer, um, a pathway to success for them. Because mm -hmm. a lot of them are struggling upon returning to the United States. Thank you very much. Um, I I'll share with you a couple things about that. Uh, several years uh, ago, the college started a program, Come Back to College, and it has uh, been transformational in several areas. Uh, one that's helped, I think, to develop institutional awareness and education around the needs of returning veterans, uh, and also very thoughtfully has offered programming for both college employees but also for students. Uh, we've created spaces uh, for returning veterans. In fact, uh, we have, for the last couple of years, been ranked as one of the most uh, veteran-friendly and institutions in, uh, in across the nation. So I expect that we'll see more of that, but I also think it's interesting. I don't necessarily know if we had anyone from uh, a veterans group who served in one of the planning committees, and that might be a great opportunity for us. Um, I will never forget, uh, I was at the college of Las, I was at president of Las Positas College, and we started to see a influx of, of returning veterans to our campus. And um, I remember calling my father, who is a Vietnam uh, era veteran and talking with him about the experiences of some of these students and just making an observation as I was having this conversation. He said, he said, well, you need to do everything you can for them. And I said, well, we are daddy. And he said, but he, he said the, the wars that they're coming back from are different than the wars we came back from. And I, I was profoundly struck by that because, um, and even now, if you look at some of the data that's come out in terms of the medical needs, um, are very different than what you would have seen in previous uh, wars or conflicts. So I think your question is very appropriate for us as an organization to make sure that we're intentional about that. So I'm going to ask Dr. Long and Dr. Scott to make sure as we're going to this next phase of this plan that they have conversations with our uh, college employees who work specifically with that. If there's any outreach that we can do to community groups, that would be good as well. Thank you. Over here. Get your steps in today. <laughs> Love it. Uh, first, I just want to say thank you. The work that I have observed that you have done to educate and advocate regarding the budget mm. for this coming fiscal year has really been um, humbling for me. I know that you mentioned the ATPA last night and that there are additional open hearings. I really wanted to just get your sense of when we might know something about other than Craig Rice's very supportive tweets um, about the budget and where you think we're going and what the council's impact could be or might be. So I, I, I thank you for that, uh, Dr. Kelly. Um, there, there's some things I feel uh, fairly passionate about and uh, this particular budget season, as you know, I, I'm, um, I'm struggling to understand some of the dynamics in it. Um, this year, the college submitted a budget uh, that did several things. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I just want to reiterate them because I think it's an important point to be made. Uh, we submitted a budget this year that was 1% less in appropriation uh, than what we have requested the previous year. In fact, if I'm correct, we're probably the only county agency that did that, uh, according to what I've been able to find out. Uh, we were asked to respond with a savings plan, uh, which we did uh, respond. And in, in, in those of you who don't know what a savings plan is, uh, so Montgomery County S to me. Um, what we were asked to do is to save money in the current fiscal year, and then you advance that towards your next fiscal year. I was told when I first arrived here, this was not a cut because I said, we got a cut. They said, no, it's not a cut, it's a savings plan. I'm like, no, it's a cut. 
<laughs> because you're being asked to cut money out of the current fiscal year and you advance into the next fiscal year. You can call it what you want to call it, but it's a cut. <laughs> so we cut $2.8 million out of this year's budget and we are advancing it to forward fund into the next fiscal year budget. Uh, during the process of developing the budget, we were cognizant of several things. One, the college has continued uh, to be strongly supported by our county, but our county is experiencing some significant fiscal challenges right now. So we could not go in and ask the county for additional money well, we know they just simply did not exist, a uh, significant, significant amount of money. So we cut $8 million. And let me say that we, we all did that. Those of you who have budgets that you are responsible for, you had to go back and look at where we can make those cuts. You were very deliberate about that. So the budget that we submitted had the savings plan. It had the $8 million. We then advanced several things that we knew we had to do. We wanted to expand the middle college and early college programs. We knew that we needed uh, some more financial aid advisors who could help uh, counselors help our students as they're navigating those systems. And I think one other small thing that we were asking for. But the biggest one was compensation. We knew that our employees needed a compensation adjustment. They had deserved that. Um, it was pointed out to me last night, and someone said, you know, Darian, you haven't said a lot about this because you're trying to be cognizant of what's happening in the county. You're trying to be the good statesman that you're supposed to be as a college president. But you of all people know uh, how expensive it is to live in Montgomery County. I have no doubt about that. Uh, what's very important about this is that our employees live in this area. Uh, the cost of living in Montgomery County and surrounding areas is one of the highest in the nation. We know that to be true right now. So we deserve to be able to provide salary adjustments to our employees in ways that can help uh, mitigate some of the challenges that exist in that space. That's how we retain employees. And you hear all of our students talk about it is the employees of the college that do that work for them. Um, I meet uh, each semester with new faculty, and many of them are moving to this area. They're coming in. I know what it's like, where are you living? What are you talking about? I spend time with our rising professionals. I host them every year at, a, at an event. I understand the realities of what it is to live in an expensive county. Uh, I know what we have to do when we have to recruit people, and people are negotiating salary, people who don't take jobs because they're worried about that. Others are trying to figure out how they can get more money to stay here. So I, I'm struggling. That when we ask for $3.1 million, um, after we've made the cuts that we've made, uh, after we have negotiated uh, contracts that are certainly not what we want to be able to provide, but what we know that we can provide, what we know what the county has said to us that they have been able to do for us in the past, and how to be a fair and equitable partner and steward of the resources that the county invests in us in the state, it's hard to understand how we get to this moment. Your point is well taken. We're going to be doing uh, a series of, um, the county has this, uh, open hearings over the next two more days. And then on Friday, uh, we have our budget hearing. So we'll hear the action from the education committee is that they will, what it, they will forward to the full council. And at that particular point, they're trying to reconcile several issues that are happening here. You have uh, um, a county executive who feels he has to respond to several competing issues, and I don't envy that. Uh, that is a, not a job I want, because I know that you have to balance many different needs in that. Uh, but you also, just those of you who were there last night, there are some profound gaps in the budget that have left many people concerned about the next fiscal year. Uh, we've seen that both in terms of what MCPS has asked for, uh, above maintenance of effort. We saw that last night with the disabled community, or representatives of that community. We've seen that every night you'll see different people speaking to this need. So I don't know how this is going to play out, because there is a finite amount of money. And as the county executive said, he left $10 million to the council to be able to respond to. I'd like to think they're working with 6.9, because we need 3.1. Uh, but at the end of the day, there's a whole reality about how that's going to be navigated. And um, it's going to be an interesting time to watch. Uh, we do have a couple of questions sure. that have been sort of being kicked around by a lot of people. So okay. uh, I thought I would uh, ask you them. Um, first question is, is it true that we're going to have to go to 
begin to log on with a two-factor authentic authentication now. 2FA, 2FA. Yeah. Okay. And this is fun because I, I just did a video for them, for IT, uh, yesterday. And uh, first of all, people who were, it is, yes, it is true. So let me answer the question. The question is, yes, it is true. Uh, but there are some very specific reasons why. And I think this is a, a very important point for us to think about. Um, one of the most significant risks that, are, that are, is affecting any business, but higher education in particular as well, is the data that we have and the need to protect that data on a routine and regular basis. So yes, we're moving to two-factor uh, uh, authentication, 2FA. Uh, it's a very simple uh, process where you download an app to your uh, phone, and when someone is attempting to their, uh, step, go into your account and access certain pieces of information, you have to verify that it is you doing that. Um, it is minimally, I think, what you would want to be done with your personnel information, with your payroll, which you can get through MyMC, with your email. Uh, maybe we'll get a point where we don't have to do all those phishing scams. I just saw there was a new email out about the re results of that. The goal is to move away from that. And it really is about stewardship uh, at the end of the day. I think all of us expect uh, vendors with whom we do business to protect our data. Uh, many of us have these factors, uh, 2FA, when we do this with other, um, our health care records oftentimes, uh, businesses or your credit cards that you use, uh, any number of different things. This is our attempt as an organization to make sure that we avoid the penetrations that oftentimes are being had. If you ever want to be scared, sometimes just talk to uh, our IT team and security, and they can tell you about the numbers of people from all over the globe who are attacking. I think that was the Danes. Was it last year we had a major uh, uh, thrust for, I don't know what we did to the Danes, but they <laughs> wanted to get inside Montgomery College. Now, we don't know where they were rerouted from. I got some theories about that as well. But what's very important about that is that this is about stewardship. It's about protecting your data. It's about protecting the data of our students. It's ultimately about protecting uh, us as an organization so that we don't have those penetrations. So the yes, that's a long answer to yes. <laughs> And it's easy. It's easy. If I can do it, anybody can do it. All right. We have about uh, eight minutes left or so. Okay. Um, uh, I understand there's a couple of events coming up later this spring uh, that you would like to talk about uh, to promote, so to speak. Can you give me a hint? Um, <laughs> equi oh, the Equity Summit. Thank you. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. I want to tell you... <laughs> via Sharon Bland, uh, that we will be having our first annual Equity Summit. Uh, that's going to be taking place on April 30th uh, at this campus. Uh, we have one of the co-chairs here who has done a fabulous job at helping to uh, organize that plan, and we're deeply grateful to them. Uh, what I think is pretty powerful about the way we've done this is that uh, the theme of this, and it kind of reminds me of the same thing about the phenomenal work being done by Shaw Center. So every college on, across the country started to recognize, thanks to Sarah Robb's work, that we had basic needs and security. So what did we all go and do? We started creating food pantries, right? So we started saying, <clears throat> we're going to solve basic needs and security by putting food pantries on campuses. Well, what we realized, that's, that's great, but that's a Band-Aid. Right? That's an introductory level type of work to that, and it's important. So what I love about our Shaw work is moving beyond the food pantry, right? It's talking about policy. It's talking about connections. Same thing with the Equity Summit. When everybody says, hey, we want to be about equity and inclusion and diversity, what do we do? We say, oh, let's go get trained, and we all put the picture up of the, of the fence where people see the, the kids at the baseball game. You know what I'm talking about? And we talk about diversity. Okay, what are we going to do about it? Right? Y'all know some of y'all know exactly. What so that to me is what the equity summit is. That's the next level of the work. The intent is that people will leave with a toolkit. We're also going to be talking about pathways for students in this, which I think is very exciting, pathways for employees within the organization, and really helping us to define our work much more intentionally around equity and inclusion. One day summit, guarantee it won't be the last, and it's probably going to be a continuation of efforts in this space. And really want to thank uh, Pacey Group and the leadership for making that happen. Oh, we have a question here in the audience. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Hello, Hi. how are you? Um, fine, thank you. Um, I know that compensation is the biggest part of our budget. It's the biggest part it of is. our budget. 80%. Um, yes. 
What I would like, though, is for someone to revisit the issue of having the staff pay scale frozen. Um, as of right now, used to when we had the salary structure, it inched whenever there was a general wage adjustment slash COLA. It's frozen now. So if there's a general wage adjustment and you're at the top of the pay scale, you no longer get it, you're stuck there. So I would really like for some, I, I know we probably don't have the money for it, but I would really like for someone to revisit the issue and maybe unfreeze it. So I, I, what, and <clears throat> I think, well, first of all, thank you for that. And I also know the courage it, it is to stand up in these spaces and ask that question. So let me applaud that. And you know me well enough, I'm going to be very direct in my response. Um, it's highly unlikely that we'll be unfrozen for several reasons. Uh, one is that it is about a market-based system. So one of the things that the college has had a long history of, and I think it's been an asset to us, is that we were able to retain, we've been able to retain employees for a uh, significant number of years, which is great because there's institutional knowledge and power and potency in that. But as a result of that, we have employees that for a, a job grouping have reached to a level that there are no, their, their salary is above a market. So if they were not able to work at Montgomery College, they would not probably earn the salary that they're receiving right now. So we adopted and the board adopted because we have to think about this long term. How do we get a sustainable, because as you point out, 80% of the college's budget is spent on compensation and benefits. So how do we start to corral that in a way that makes more sense? And we aligned it to a market-based system. Now, what I will be willing to do is to go back and see how many employees are affected by this and to see if there is something that I'm missing about that. Unfortunately, I don't know how we get around that because the reality is that if we then we start to skew the market more because even though we add the general wage adjustment to it, it continues to increase that and that's not just a one-time expense. That goes to base and it continues to add up. So I know the concern. I've heard that and I know that um, the expectation is different. And, and how can we as an organization think about that? I'm happy to go back and do it. I don't see it changing. And it would be unfair for me to say, I'm going to go back and look at you and I'm going to send somebody else to go and tell you, no, I, th this is, I need to, and probably somebody needs to hear me say that. So thank you, though. I appreciate you. All right, we have just a couple of minutes left. Do you okay. have any uh, final remarks or notes that you'd like to make? I just want to say thank you all for coming and thank you for your participation here today. I just want to say thank you to my beloved who stayed here and stayed awake on the front row. Uh, <laughs> she, uh, she told me, she said, I'm going to stay awake. I said, that's good. All this. All this higher ed mumbo jumbo can be a lot for, but thank you all so much. I look forward to the end of the semester as the time of celebration about what we really do at Montgomery College. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pollard. And uh, we do encourage everyone to get involved. The MC 2025 listening sessions are beginning soon, and we hope that many of you can attend and participate. One final note before we say goodbye. The video of today's State of the College Address will be available online at montgomerycollege.edu slash State of the College. For everyone at MCTV, thank you so much for watching today.